people. Uh, yes, and now it's there. I was waiting for that to click in. We are recording this, so it will appear on the SIU YouTube channel. So for the people who are absent, they can watch it to catch up. Um, just so you know that this is on Zoom, so we are live for the people who are in here on live. Some people may be watching on YouTube. If you have any questions at the end of the presentation, feel free to raise your hand. Um, you could type them into the chat, but I'm not sure that Dr. Shelby Caffey would be able to see them. So I think it's for preference for raising your hand or just you know, making yourself visible and asking your question. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna let Dr. Shelby Caffey go ahead and make her presentation. And thank you all for attending. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna take a moment uh, just to talk to you about how we're gonna spend our time today. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy end of the semester schedule uh, to attend this open forum. I'm Crystal Shelby Caffey. I'm your colleague from the School of Education. And I've been asked to talk about the challenges and future of graduate education here at SIU. Um, first, I'd like to take a moment to share just a little bit about my background and experiences. Uh, then I'll discuss some of the challenges that we're currently facing in graduate education, followed by a discussion of how we might reimagine the Saluki graduate experience in very practical ways that offer, uh, offer opportunities and ideas for us to lean into those challenges. And then finally, I'm going to end by taking your questions. So as I stated, um, I'm in the School of Education. I'm an Associate Professor of Language Literacies and Culture. I teach in the elementary education program, and I also work with master students who are seeking an endorsement to become either a reading teacher or reading specialist. At the doctoral level, I work with uh, students in curriculum instruction who are focused on literacy in particular. Much of my research and scholarship focuses on the experiences of students and faculty of color while also um, using a lens that looks at diversity, equity, inclusion, access, and belonging. I also, uh, in my work, focus on new literacies. And this is the term that's used to describe this space where new and ever-emerging technologies intersect with literacy and they require us as these new technologies are uh, coming about, we have to develop new ways of being literate. Prior to the university restructuring, I served as the interim department chair for curriculum and instruction. I oversaw the programs, faculty and staff here on campus, as well as at Ren Lake Marketplace and University Center at Lake County. At least one program in the department underwent and received CAPE accreditation during my time as interim chair. Along with colleagues, we actively explored opportunities to partner with colleagues across campus to create additional pathways for high school teachers to earn master's degrees. During that same time, I was introduced to the president of the Golden Apple Scholars Program of Illinois. This program works to alleviate the K-12 teacher shortage in the state. One of the ways that they do so is by partnering with universities statewide and offering scholarships for their scholars to attend any of those partner universities. I brought a proposal about partnering with Golden Apple to faculty and CNI. And ultimately we started looking at um, options for creating an online program for career changers who were wanting to become elementary teachers. Though it took a long time, it took planning and it took some hard discussions, these conversations served as the impetus for what will now be SIU's 
online elementary ed program, and it's scheduled to launch this coming fall. In 2017, I had the opportunity to serve as the project coordinator um, for a grant um, from the Illinois Board of Higher Ed and uh, based around No Child Left Behind Act. It was called the NCLB IBAG K-12 Teacher Enhancement Grant. So the funding for the grant served two purposes. It was intended to increase the number of qualified teachers working with students for whom English wasn't their first language. And also we wanted to increase the number of high school teachers qualified to teach dual credit courses. That role called for me to recruit grad students, <laughs> excuse me, and to be their single point of contact with SIU. In addition, I served as the liaison between the co-PIs of the grant and other deans across campus. I also served as um, the liaison between the co-PIs and the funding agency. I was tasked with, though I did not know this at the time I accepted this mission, I was tasked with writing the mid-cycle and the final reports um, as well as submitting a request for a funding reallocation, which resulted in us holding a conference for local teachers. My work with that grant led to me being asked to now serve as SIU's dual credit program coordinator. Earlier in my career at SIU, I served as the program coordinator for language literacies and culture. I work to streamline the review of graduate applicants and create processes for keeping track of grad students seeking reading endorsements. I also organize a brown bag series to help acclimate incoming doctoral students to departmental procedures. Outside of my work as a program coordinator, I drew upon my experiences entering higher education and I realized that there needed to be some sort of formal and informal mentorship. So while still being a junior faculty member myself, I operated as a mentor to new junior faculty entering my specialty area. I offered as much information and support as I could to help them succeed. I even went so far as to organize an informal training to assist with um, helping them adjust to their new role in the department. In addition, I created an affinity group for female faculty of color, which resulted in multiple collaborations, as well as various members of the group, including myself, receiving much needed mentorship. The final aspect of my work that I wanna share is regarding engagement. I had the pleasure of being the director of the Saluki Kids Academy, during which I initially partnered with the I Can Read program. My work in this area fed my need to stay connected to my roots in elementary education. I went on to create partnerships with both Carbondale and the Murfreesboro Elementary School Districts. As the director of the Saluki Kids Academy, I was responsible for designing a program that provided free summer literacy tutoring in a day camp setting for eligible students in grades kindergarten through five. I worked with graduate students in my course because the camp was paired with one of my courses, an assessment course. And a month before the program started, I learned that there was no funding. I was told initially that there was money. And then a month before I learned that there were zero dollars for this program. So along with my graduate students, we tapped local businesses and SIU alum as partners who then provided goods and services throughout the camp. And this went on for several years in that iteration. The elementary students who participated spent their mornings on campus receiving personalized literacy tutoring from our grad students um, who were working on their reading endorsement and they spent afternoon exploring activities throughout Southern Illinois. They went um, horseback riding, fishing, 
um, swimming, all kinds of things. So those are just a, some of the activities that I've engaged in uh, during my time at SIU. And although I've worked closely with grad students, um, and I've worked closely with grad students in various capacities throughout that time. So next, I'm going to spend some time looking at several challenges that we're facing right now. Um, but before we do, I'd like to acknowledge that the challenges that we're about to discuss um, are based on my experiences as well as information um, that I've been able to find. I know that if I took an impromptu poll, each of you could identify a challenge based on your experiences and they possibly be completely different from what I'm about to talk about and it may be stuff that's not even on my radar. So first, I believe that a reframing of the discussion is necessary to situate our thinking. Again, I was asked to speak about the challenges in the future of our graduate school. Coming to this as a former elementary educator with a background in language literacy and, and culture, I believe that words have power. The language that we use impacts our thoughts and our thoughts impact our actions. The areas that I'm about to speak on are indeed challenges in that they pose a problem that should stimulate us to action. So we have an opportunity and an obligation to act. However, it's the action part that I wanna focus on. These challenges aren't new and they aren't confined to this campus, but it's how we view them and how we approach them that could make the difference. So I want us to keep in, work, in mind the words of Robert Redford. As we talk throughout this discussion, he said that problems can become opportunities when the right people come together. So let's look at the challenges that we're being presented. And then we're gonna follow up with opportunities for us to act on those challenges. We'll start by looking at recruitment. The continued success of our graduate programs hinges on our ability to attract students. We should make every attempt to attract students that reflect the world's diversity and who will become the next generation of thinkers, doers, and leaders in our respective fields. If your graduate programs are anything like the one I'm in, you've seen a drastic decrease in applicants over the years. Increasingly, grad students are looking for more options with regard to program modality, whether it be on campus or virtual, um, as well as course scheduling. For example, putting courses at times that fit busy lifestyles and whether the courses are offered synchronously or asynchronously. While it seems like both our number of grad applicants and the number of grad students admitted have taken the same trajectory over the last four years with numbers declining then dipping precipitously in 2020 and then gradually rebounding. Our graduate enrollment followed a similar yet different path. Enrollment has not rebounded at the same rate. And our actual graduate enrollment numbers are lower than they were prior to the pandemic. There's also this increasing gap between the number of students admitted and those who actually enroll. The question becomes, what opportunities are there for us to recruit from a wider, more diverse body and to increase our chances at having these recruits be admitted and for them to actually enroll? But recruitment is just one piece of this puzzle. Once we successfully recruit the grad students, we must be able to help them persist. Retaining them and getting them graduated is our ultimate goal. 
It's my understanding that we lose roughly 20% of our master's students after the first year and somewhere between 10 and 12% of doctoral students. I know the institutional research is working to disaggregate the numbers relative to those who graduate versus those who drop out or stop out. Um, they're also looking at the numbers regarding the retention of students from minority group and those from underrepresented backgrounds. But either way, if we go with the numbers that we currently have, I think that we can agree that losing a quarter of our master's students is not what we're aiming for. None of us want that. For us to survive and thrive, we need to retain as many of our students as we can. And while the reasons as to why students don't continue are numerous, and many of them are out of our control, we can still examine opportunities that exist for us to improve our retention rates for all graduates, all grad students. So let's assume that you've managed to recruit top candidates into your graduate programs. What resources have been used to do this? Has the student secured an internal fellowship? Was there external money available? Perhaps they were offered an assistantship. For most graduate students, one key factor in choosing a program and remaining in the program centers on financial support. Our financial reports indicate that there has been a decrease in expenditures for fellowships and other awards. How are graduate students financing their education? Students need assurances that they will be able to afford coming here and staying here for graduate school. How has this reduction in fellowships and awards impacted our graduate students and in turn impacted our ability to attract and retain students? What information do applicants receive at the time of admissions and throughout their time with us that will help them identify and apply for viable sources of funding? This loss of funding presents an opportunity for us to reimagine other sources of funding for graduate school. Finally, let's discuss programming. Take a look at your industry. What skills and knowledge are, are needed for our students to be competitive in that industry? Now, look at your graduate program and your course offerings. Do they reflect the current and future industry needs? Are there things that we can do in the short term that will set us and our students up for success in the long term? We all know that lots of things change during the pandemic. There are needs that have come to the forefront that we likely never considered before. How are we, how are we responding to those market forces? This shift offers us an opportunity to reimagine our programs and how we meet the needs of students and the various sectors in which they will be working. Now, I want you to draw your attention to the image that's on this slide in the upper left-hand corner. I want you to note that it consists of four pieces that form the shape of a light bulb. So puzzle pieces. Taking away any of these pieces would render our puzzle incomplete and unusable. If any of you have kids, you know one puzzle piece, the puzzle gets chucked. The puzzle pieces work in tandem to complete the picture, just as the four areas noted on the slide are interconnected, and each has the potential to impact the other areas. We need cutting edge programming and competitive funding sources to be able to recruit and retain graduate students. Now, I need you to stretch your thinking with me, and let's assume that this is a working light bulb. We know that for it to work, we would also need something to screw it into as well as a power source and a means for controlling the power so that it doesn't burn out. Similarly, these areas of opportunity don't stand alone. These are simply the ones that I chose to highlight. And I understand, again, that you may have other areas that cause concern and that present opportunities for growth. However, 
I offer those listed simply as a starting place for further shared discussions. Now, I'd like to offer some suggestions for how we might move forward. So what might the future of graduate education look like here at SIU? Remember that all of the challenges that were just discussed, as well as those that you thought about, provide opportunities for us to take action. They are opportunities for us to reimagine the Saluki graduate experience. As we embark on this shared venture of reimagining the Saluki graduate experience, I want us to focus on the graduate school's role in leading the path. As we do so, keep in mind that this cannot and should not be a solo endeavor. It will take all of us collectively striving towards the same goals. To frame this part of the discussion, let's talk about partnerships, let's talk about applicants, let's talk about community, and let's talk about knowledge. Leaning in means taking the opportunity to explore and develop mutual mutually beneficial partnerships and collaborations that are internal to SIU, external, and those centered on partnering with alumni. These partnerships are crucial to recruitment and retention efforts. As we look to expand our recruitment efforts globally and embrace diverse populations, both the Center for International Education and the Multicultural Resource Center will be key partners. Working to develop joint programming with both of these units has the potential to strengthen the graduate Saluki experience by streamlining access to information and will increase recruitment and retention efforts. Further partnering with student affairs will help to create a holistic experience for our graduate students. Connecting with career services to develop workshops and events tailored to the needs of grad students who will enter public and private sector jobs. That will help ensure that our graduates are well prepared. This could take the form of graduate recruitment fairs or hosting mock interviews for academic government and private sector jobs. I see opportunities for the graduate school to partner with SIU Global and the Center for Teaching Excellence to explore ways that we can expand our reach by creating multiple pathways for our students to join the Saluki family. I believe that this particular partnership is vital to our growth and sustainability. Why? Because the future of higher ed is happening right now and it's happening online and we need to play a role, a more active role in this process. We can't have this conversation without considering funding. Over the last several years, we've seen a decrease in the number of available assistantships due to a reduction in funding for assistantships. A prospective student who cannot find a viable solution for funding a graduate degree is a student that will never be a Saluki. Or if we get them, we'll be in grave danger of losing them. Therefore, partnering with the foundation to help secure more funding for graduate students and funding that students can apply for independently without being recommended by a faculty member could go a long way in our recruitment and retention efforts. This aspect of being able to apply independently <clears throat> is also important as we look at designing various modes of programs. While I believe that students and instructors can and should develop relationships in online courses, in fact, I think it's crucial. Um, students shouldn't be penalized for not having those connections. Likewise, it will be helpful for OSPA to host workshops specifically for grad students about applying for external funding and walking them, walking them through the steps of applying. Perhaps the grad school could also partner with OSPA to locate 
grant funding that we could apply for to support our students. Developing external partnerships will allow us to reimagine the Saluki graduate experience by providing pipelines for students for whom matriculation into a graduate program may not be possible at their current institution. We can start by partnering with SIUE. We should explore opportunities that will allow students from SIUE to easily be considered for complementary doctoral programs on our campus. And likewise, look at graduate programs that are offered on the Edwardsville campus that we don't offer here and direct our potential students there to their colleagues there. I'd also like to suggest a virtual graduate school fair to recruit jointly for programs on both campuses. External partnerships can also take the form of collaborations with other universities that don't offer specific graduate degrees. Again, hosting a Come Run With Us event would help us get the word out about our graduate programs. Finally, the SIU Foundation does an excellent job of connecting with alum. Beyond their donations, I want us to consider how we might partner with alum to create paid internships and externships for our graduates. Let's also revisit our mentorship initiatives with an intention, intentional focus on grad students. And that's not to say that I don't believe that our undergrads need mentors, far from it. As an undergrad, I served as a big sister on this campus to someone just a year under me. We are still very much connected to this day. So I do see the power in having mentors and I want to reimagine a Saluki graduate experience in which we actively work to foster those kinds of relationships between our alum and our graduate students, even if they're not in the same discipline. Now let's talk about applicants. In 2022, we had 1,029 applicants from 55 nations apply for grad programs. We admitted 807 from 42 nations, but even still, the majority of our grad students, 641 of them came from the US and most of those came from Illinois. The diversity that exists on our campus is, it's impressive, yet there's still an opportunity for us to increase the diversity of our graduate student population and for us to be a university committed to providing access to graduate education. Somehow, we missed an opportunity to admit graduate students from an additional 13 nations. Now, perhaps they weren't viable candidates or Maybe we need to examine our application processes for international students and see where we might streamline them. In addition, there's an opportunity for us to capitalize on the diversity that exists right here in the US. Remember, we just talked about partnerships. This is where we have an opportunity to develop relationships with tribal colleges and universities, HBCUs and HSIs. So historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions. Which brings us to how we're recruiting graduate students. In 1994, and I'm gonna date myself kind of, I graduated from SIU as a 20 year old first generation college student. At no point in time do I recall anyone discussing options with me about staying here for graduate school. My husband's experience was different. He was recruited into the first class of prompt fellows. But here I was, and me and him didn't know each other at the time, but here I was as a 20 year old with no place to go. Life stuff happened with my family. I had no place to go. So, I started classes as an undeclared grad student. 
that decision likely did more academic harm to me than good. It was misguided. However, after taking a break for a couple of years, getting focused, um, I enrolled in an elementary ed program at Roosevelt University. But it still, to this day, stands out to me that no one ever tried to recruit me to stay here or even mentioned it as a possibility. So let's fast forward 30 years. I now have a son about to graduate from SIU in a couple of weeks. His grades are better than mine. And still, no one has ever talked to him about staying other than us, but you know, as parents, we don't know anything. Why not? Why are we allowing other universities to snatch our students who make it to the bachelor's finish line? This is an opportunity where we can reimagine the Saluki graduate experience. What might it look like to recruit our own students? We can go back to that Come Run With Us event that I discussed earlier, a grad school fair, maybe a grad bash, and recruit our own students. Might individual colleges be willing to participate in such activities that will have the potential to boost their enrollment? We need to start planting these seeds early, sophomore year, junior year, and often. Now, let's talk about connections. Once grad students have committed to SIU, be it on campus, off campus, online, what opportunities exist for us to welcome them to the Saluki family and create experiences that make them feel connected to the institution? It's important to ensure that our grad students both on and off campus are able to build community by connecting with other Salukis. They must also feel genuinely cared for. The graduate school can play a role in this by hosting events, both live and virtual, that will help students integrate, find resources and other interest groups, and that will enhance their graduate experience. This is where we can also rely on our alum who are in the workforce to serve as mentors. Grad students work closely with faculty in their programs, and it can be difficult for them to connect with one another, especially as newer faculty are trying to find their footing. How might we help facilitate this connection? Diversifying our faculty and staff campus-wide, including the graduate school, will provide other avenues for our graduate students to make connections and build community. In addition, we could help better prepare faculty to work with graduate students by offering faculty workshops that focus on how to work with students at different stages. For instance, guiding them through the thesis or dissertation process. We could learn from one another and share what's being done by various programs or faculty to engage grad students and build rapport. For instance, throughout the pandemic, I made a point to connect with my doctoral student who was back and forth between here and Kuwait. We used WhatsApp and Zoom. We bonded over a love for cooking and food, regularly sharing pictures of our meals. We also used Zoom to cook together while working through the prospectus and dissertation. This was my way of strengthening my connection with the student, even though we couldn't be in the same space. The last thing I'll say about connections is that we need to remember that we have graduate students from all over the world who choose to become Salukis. We have an obligation to make this, to make SIU home for whatever length of time they're gonna be with us. We must help them feel connected. We must be a part of their community and we must care for them. As we disembark on a shared venture of reimagining the Saluki graduate experience, let's talk about knowledge. Part of this centers on knowledge of our students and we'll couple that with knowledge of our respective industries and the programs that we offer. 
So what does it mean to be a first-generation college student? At what point is one no longer considered a first-generation college student? We often use this term to identify students who are the first in their family to attend college. I've never heard the term used to describe grad students. However, at the undergrad level, there are multiple layers of support built in to aid first-generation students in succeeding. We know that typically first-generation students don't have access to the knowledge about how college works or what to expect. But consider this, one status as a first-generation student doesn't magically disappear simply because they have successfully earned a bachelor's degree. The reality for many students like myself, like my husband, like many of the people that we know is that they cannot reach back into their family to gather up knowledge about the processes for applying to grad school or for being successful should they happen to get in. This is where knowledge of our grad students can help us to reimagine the Saluki graduate experience. This is also part of the reason that helping them to connect, build community, and feel a sense of belonging matters. We need to have knowledge about our students to help us create targeted programming that will help them succeed at SIU and beyond. Within the grad school, we can host a series of brown bags or workshops to help students get acclimated. And we could work with faculty and other entities across campus to provide information about attending conferences, building relationships within the program, applying for fellowships, the importance of publishing, or you name it, any number of topics. These workshops, would also allow us to reimagine the Saluki graduate experience by providing just in time information that could contribute to student success and retention. Finally, as purveyors of knowledge, we're accustomed to ensuring that we remain up to date in our respective fields. How often do we do that within our programs? Are we looking at current and future needs in our fields and designing or altering programs such that our grad students are sought after for their cutting edge knowledge and skills? Opportunities exist for us to reimagine the Saluki graduate experience by creating micro credentials, graduate certificates, and running content specific boot camps to help prepare them for life here and beyond SIU. What an exciting time to be a Saluki. I'm excited about the possibility of working with you to reimagine the Saluki graduate experience. Remember, this cannot and should not be a solo endeavor. It will take all of us. We are the right people and we can come together. I know that each of us will continue to do our part to recruit, retain, educate, and graduate the next, next generation of graduate students. Let's lean into these challenges and make great strides by taking opportunities to reimagine the Saluki graduate experience. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions. And if you could just raise your hand and I'll call on people as opposed to putting them in chat. Craig Philbrook. Uh, hello, Dr. Shelby Coffey. Um, my name is Craig Inger Philbrook. I'm the chair of the Graduate Council. Um, thank you for your presentation today. Uh, my question for the candidates is, what, um, uh, what do you see as the role of the arts in graduate education? So for example, MFAs or our um, various uh, doctoral degrees in theater and so on. So those programs and are as much a part of graduate education as um, any other programs. Um, my background prior to grad school was in communications. Um, and my master's is in elementary education. Um, so I think that for us to have a well-rounded 
be a well-rounded institution, we need those programs. They're vital to us moving forward. They're vital to our success as well. Thank you. Welcome. Are there other questions? Oh, y'all are doing like students now being silent and just with your screens off. Does anyone else have a question that I can answer? Um, I'll let you all think and I'll talk to you a little bit about um, what I'm calling um, my like Saluki life cycle. You heard me say that I came here um, as an undergraduate when I was 16 years old. Um, I actually lived in the dorms. I was a student worker in Woody Hall. I left and I moved back to Chicago for a couple of years. Uh, worked on my master's degree, taught there, and I moved back here uh, with my family quite some time ago. And I my, worked on my doctorate in the very department. Well, that sounds weird because departments don't exist, but I'm going to use it because it was a department then. But in the very department in curriculum and instruction where I am uh, now. And things have kind of come full circle in that as a graduate student, I was a GA, I was a TA. Um, I was immersed in the community in those roles. Um, I've been a program coordinator. I've been an interim department chair, and now I'm a Saluki mom. So I think that this is one of the things that prepares me for this role is because of the various um, roles that I have experienced as a Saluki, it gives me a different perspective. I can see things from all of those perspectives. You know, again, as a mom, why hasn't anyone tried to get, you know, my kid to stay here again? Because I'm a parent, I don't know what I'm talking about. And so I need one of y'all to nudge them and say, you know, have you considered this? Um, why aren't we doing that? Questions? Or other things that you want me to touch on? Um, I'll talk about one other thing. And this may not be a question that you have. This may be more what um, staff that I would be working directly with would ask, but I also think it's important to talk about. Oftentimes in situations like this, you're asked what kind of leader are you? Like what's your leadership style? Which is an interesting question because I don't think there, that anyone should subscribe to one particular leadership style. I think it's situational. I think it in education, there's this term called kid watching where you have to know your students so that you know how to work with them and meet their needs. I think as a leader, um, the same thing is true. You have to know the different constituency groups that you're working with and how to work with them. And so sometimes, you know, they'll require coaching. Um, other times, person just needs to be able to make a decision. A leader just needs to be able to make a decision. So, you know, democratic processes kind of go out of the window. Um, and then even still at other times, a leader will serve as an encourager, someone to nudge someone along the path. And so as I kind of reflect back to my both formal and informal experiences with leading, I've done all of those things. Um, and, and I try to, I think I'm very adept at actually encouraging colleagues to uh, step out of their comfort zone, to, to operate in whatever their gift is, because I think that some of us operate better in certain spaces, but then to also step out of their comfort zone and try something new and different. 
And so even in this role, I, people who know me closely can tell you, I like to try new things. That's the only way we're going to learn whether or not it works. Because if we keep doing the same thing, we're going to keep getting the same result. And I think we want different results. So how can we brainstorm? How can we collaborate, work together, and try something different and see where that takes us? And don't just abandon it if it doesn't work immediately. Again, you know, in education, these things come in and then they're swept out by the next administration. Um, you got to stick with something for a while. Okay, you cannot eat salad for one day and potato chips the rest of the time and think it's going to do you well. Not if your goal is to be healthier. So you got to kind of stick with something and try it out. Questions? This is so remin reminiscent of education. Y'all are making me practice my good old fashioned wait time. Wait time, just sit and wait. Do you mind if I ask another question? Go right ahead. Uh, I I have my camera off because I have slight seizure stuff. And you're fine. Visually distracted. No, you're fine. I have a face for you to talk to here. Um, what do you see as some of the implications of some of your work with new literacies and technologies for some of the emerging concern about the role of AI in, um, and, and but also the promise, but also some mm -hmm. of the dangers, uh, particularly as we're thinking about graduate students working on theses and dissertations. So um, I'm glad that Peter Fadi is on here because I can give him accolades that I probably have never given him in, in person. Um, but I'm gonna start with saying, quite honestly, I am the more let's jump into the arena kind of person and try things. Technology is going to be there. You can't stop what's happening with technology. So I believe in co-opting technology for our purposes. Okay, cell phones, for instance, I wrote, um, an article with my sons and my husband. My sons were in middle school when we wrote this article. And in the article, we discussed how um, they were in the acad academically talented program. And so they got to do these cool projects like making movies and all of it. Like I came home to a full scene in my driveway. I'm like, what is going on here? They were working on a project. The kids in the regular classes didn't get an opportunity to do that. So they're disadvantaged with that technology. And oftentimes in schools, you know, there's a no cell phone policy and this, you know, why couldn't we take the cell phones and like make them work for us? They have this whole computer in your pocket. Why can't we use it? And so that's where I would approach this. We can't get rid of AI and all that. How can we co-opt it? I mentioned Peter Fadi um, earlier because early on in my time here, um, I decided that I wanted to start incorporating more technology into my classes. And I'll give you a little bit like history about that. I lived in an intergenerational household. So my grandmother was there. She had a pacemaker and we could not use a uh, microwave. So when I came to college, I didn't know how to use the microwave. So I dang near burned down the dorms because <laughs> I didn't know how to use the microwave, right? Um, I also thought that you could fax money. And I know that might, it, it is funny. You can laugh. It is funny. I thought that you could fax money because I just didn't have experience with various technologies. And then I met people here, like the girls who live next door to me, they had learned coding languages and, and things like that. And I went to like one of the best high schools in Chicago. And at that time, I decided, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so behind. That's so embarrassing. I'll never feel like that again, <laughs> not with regard to technology. And so um, once I started here, I decided, um, I wonder how many teachers are behind like I was which means that if they're behind, their students are gonna be behind. 
because they're not using the technology. And so I went to Peter and I'm like, okay, Peter, I wanna do some stuff in my classes. And he worked with me and he's like, you just gotta do it. It's okay to learn with them. And so that's the approach that I've taken. We don't have to be an expert to start co-opting these things. If we create an environment in which everyone knows we're doing this together, we're learning together. I have thrown the technology at my students and I never teach them how to make, how to use it. This is what I got from Peter. He said, they're gonna figure it out. He said, what you're really trying to do is give them the mindset to where they're okay figuring it out because the technology always changes. So that's what I've done. And I do believe like my students, when the pandemic hit, I think my students should have been just fine. Teachers who had me in the past should have at least been comfortable, like, okay, I can do this. And so with regard to AI and um, students writing graduate papers, um, I'm going to say this, and this may not be popular, but students are paying people to write papers right now. And if we don't know that, we are kidding ourselves. Students are paying people right now to do papers. How can we embrace that technology and make it work for us? That's going to look different in different areas. Thank you. And I apologize, I have to leave a little bit early, but thank you so much. For thank you so much for, thank you for your questions. Take care. So I am going to actually, um, Peter, did you have a question? Well, I, I did. You, you kind of called me yes. out there. So I got to throw some, something. I in. did. So thank you. Cause I've never, ever like said, thank you in, in person. I really appreciate the advice and the help you gave me and moving forward with that. And I've just taken it and I've run with it. <laughs> right, we don't necessarily have to figure it all out, just enough to get off the dock and start rowing. Right, right. Um, yeah, so the kind of the question is, following up the question on, on the AI and such, because you know, right over in School of Education, of course, you know, we've got a dock committee and we're discussing just these sorts of things. And, you know, you, get, you even ha have some kind of really kind of um, old in a foundational kind of way ideas like maybe more um, more oral type defenses and things like that in in, in prelims and, and, and as such. Do you see some kind of mechanism for different programs and all having those discussions since that is that this this kind of formative time right now? That was a, a good question to generate that. You know, is there is there some kind of mechanism that set up maybe out of the grad office to to do some idea sharing and see see if we can learn among ourselves? So one of the things that I mentioned um, in my presentation was bringing people together to have those those discussions so that we can learn from one another. Um, the word that comes to mind because I've done something like this in a class is a hackathon where you bring all these people with their ideas together and you kind of let people pitch their ideas and you see what, what sticks. Um, in some of the other areas, they're already doing oral, you know, defenses of like the perspective, I mean, of the thesis papers and stuff like that. They have like their prelim process, I'm sorry, is oral as opposed to written. So I do think that the graduate school could um, serve as a conduit for kind of making those conversations happen, or at least providing an opportunity for those conversations to take place. Um, one of the things that I talked about in another session, and I don't even remember what session it was at this point, was about bringing the directors of graduate studies together, because right now everyone is operating in a silo, even though with the reorg, it's not supposed to be like that, but it is. Um, so how can we bring the directors of graduate studies together so that they can, you know, talk about what's being done in their programs and what other programs might benefit. We have some programs that are doing really well online. How, what are they doing? And how could we benefit from it? And so with that, um, I actually, I know this is supposed to go all the way to 3.30, but I'm in another part of the building. I have to get to the next, part of this and I have five minutes to do so. Um, I thank you all so very much for, again, for coming and for asking questions. And 
um, if given the opportunity to serve in this role, I look forward to, to, to seeing how we can move forward. How can we reimagine things um, and the role that we'll all play in that reimagining? So thank you guys very much. All right, have a good